According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome. Good to have you with us. We've been gone forever, I think, three weeks at least. So uh, we had some time off for the holidays. Trust everybody had uh, happy holidays. Yeah, our last class here would have been on uh, December the uh, 17th. And so we're ready today now to read week 15, which is chapters 22, 23, and 24. And it was, a, it was a, the longest of all the readings we do for, uh, for volume one. And uh, so good thing we had the extra weeks to do that. Uh, we'll do this for today. And then for the rest of the volume, it's just one chapter per week for the rest of the book. Uh, one chapter per week for the final five chapters, uh, 25 through 29. We'll handle those Sunday by Sunday, uh, getting us through, uh, looks like, uh, the middle of February there on 211. So after that, we'll uh, decide if we're going to take a couple weeks off or not, but we'll, we will start. We're going to take a break from Geisler, clearly. And then uh, I think I, I, I'm really liking the, the dispensational class and the, the ideas I have for a, a dispensational class. So that's kind of what I'm leaning to right now. Uh, I also want to do doctrine classes, but uh, I think I can put those off for a little bit and make sure we're solid on our on our dispensations. So Anyway, pray about that and uh, trust that the Lord will lead me where, uh, where he wants this class to go. All right, chapter 22, we're going to deal with the neo-evangelicals. Then the chapter 23, we'll get the evangelicals. And then in chapter 24, we have the fundamentalists. And uh, some of them really put the fun in fundamentalists. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about them when we, when we get that far. But we're not going to do anything, though, without prayer. So let's start with a word of prayer. Commit our time for the glory of Jesus Christ, shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you once again just thankful. Thankful for this class. Thank you for resuming this class after our New Year's break. Thank you for the language classes that are also starting up this week. And for everything you continue to bless us with, Father, we give you the praise and the glory. Bless our time today as we review these chapters that we've read and uh, equip us, Father. Uh, we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Did you do the reading? Yes, yes, yes. This means no. Left hand, no, 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 okay. All right. Anyway, points for honesty. We'll give you that. Neo-evangelicals. All right, now, and actually leading up to this, it's a little bit unfortunate that we had the break that we had because the chapters leading up to this as well. Um, remember we had neo-orthodoxy, liberalism, the, destruct the history of destructive biblical criticism, okay? And in these chapters... Hopefully that won't keep doing that. Um, in these chapters, we saw some of the, the tremendous damage that was done by those that embraced those, those horrible German higher critics and, and the other. Um, they were prejudiced is what they were. They absolutely rejected the miraculous. They absolutely rejected divine revelation as we would teach it, uh, as the Bible would teach it. And based on those destructive views, you end up with your liberals and you end up with your neo-orthodox uh, and it's just sad. Now we're going to see a continuation of that when we get to the neo-evangelicals. Not that they, they didn't embrace it so wholeheartedly like the liberals did and the neo-orthodox. Nevertheless, even while rejecting much of it, they were still somewhat impacted. And I think that becomes pretty clear as, uh, as we go through this material. And, and you'll see that uh, as well, I'm sure. The new evangelical view is so named because it is a deviation from the long-standing evangelical teaching on Scripture. And um, I didn't make up the label. He didn't make up the label. We're kind of stuck with the labels we get. Um, it, it, part of the problem is what, what confused me at first was the label neo. And I thought, well, neo had to have come after the evangelical. So you have evangelical and then you have the neo-evangelical. So why does this chapter come first? before the next chapter where we get to the actual evangelicals. And I think, I don't mind the fact that he did that, but it's still, it's, it's curious to me. Uh, it may also be called neo-reform, since it comes mainly from theologians in the reform tradition. But since other evangelicals have adopted similar views, it's appropriate to call it neo-evangelical. And then he starts to name names, and it's good to have these names down. It's good to know who these men are related to, uh, related to this. So the most important proponent of this view is Dutch theologian Burkhauer, right? G.C. Burkhauer. 
And you'll see his name a lot. I have his complete library in Logos, and we'll refer to some of that as we go through this chapter. Uh, his follower, American theologian Jack Rogers of Fuller Seminary, holds substantially the same position. And so here's Burkauer, 1903 to 1996. Some of these guys I didn't realize were still alive when I became a pastor. I didn't realize that some of them were still uh, in my lifetime, in my pastoral lifetime, uh, were still uh, alive and writing the things that they wrote. Um, anyway, marked effect on Burkhauer, that is the effect of neo-orthodoxy. So he's definitely affected by what we studied a couple weeks ago, what we were looking at in the neo-orthodoxy chapter. Uh, but he still remained broadly within the evangelical tradition. His subtle but significant alterations on the doctrine of Scripture have had a wide influence in the United States and elsewhere. And a lot of times when I detect this, when in a conversation with somebody, and I find out that not only do they have a different hermeneutic, we can, we can discuss hermeneutics, but when they have a different philosophical approach to what the Bible even is, that makes it tougher to, to hash it out. It makes it tougher to even talk about it. And it's just like we're, we're, we're approaching it from entirely different viewpoints and what we think the Bible actually is. And so uh, that, that's, a, that's a bigger hurdle to, uh, to overcome. He revealed a significant influence from the neo-orthodox view of Karl Barth. And uh, again, is the Bible the Word of God? Kind of. Right? Yes and no, depending. Right? And uh, sad to, uh, to take an approach like that. Trying to find a distinction between the Word of God and the words of man. So trying to and we all accept the fact that the Bible is hypostatic, that God is the ultimate author, but he used human agents. And so the, the Bible is both divine and human. It's both deity and humanity. It's like a, a miniature picture of Jesus, who is both God and man, right? The hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, the hypostatic union of, of the Bible. That's fine ex until you start to try to diagram that, until you start to try to pick and choose that this is a God verse, this is a man verse. Okay, or this is a God word, this is a man word, or, or trying to, to decide that you can start judging the scriptures as far as what part you're going to hold in high regard as coming from God, and then what part you're going to hold in low regard as coming from man, where you can kind of ignore it because it's just the opinion of man anyway. And then you put yourself in that position as the arbiter, as the judge of what is the word of God. And we can't be doing that. It's, it's, both, it's fully God and fully man simultaneously at the same time. And so all scripture, every jot, every tittle, is uh, both God and man in its transmission, in its uh, sending. So some of this uh, comes up like Barth Burkara believed that the voice of God could be heard within scripture. Like parts of it, as you read it, you can hear that voice coming through. But that's a far different thing than saying, all scripture is God breathed and profitable. It's saying every, every word. They, they absolutely reject verbal plenary inspiration of scripture. And so that's a non-starter as far as I'm concerned, as far as most of us should be concerned. Burkhauer believed it is a misunderstanding to think of the Bible as a supernatural work of God. Are you kidding me? What Bible are you looking at? Okay. Do you understand how alive and powerful this is? Do you understand how through these last, you know, Peg Moses at 1500 BC, and so, you know, here we are 3,500 years after God started to write the canon. Uh, man, it's a miracle this thing is still here. And uh, not only was it, was it sent, but it was preserved. Anyway, but according to Burkhauer, no, 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 no. It's, it's a human book, and don't elevate it. It's not supernatural, okay? And he would be very much uh, opposed to our uh, philosophical approach to what the Bible is. And remember, we didn't just make that up. We took our philosophical approach to what the Bible is straight from the Bible itself. Let the Bible speak for itself. When the Bible says it's God-breathed and inspired, that is what shapes our, our bibliology, uh, the, our philosophy of, of the Bible. Anyway, uh, not so for Burkhauer. He says... Uh, Inspiration is organic, but it's not verbal and plenary. So by organic, that means God is superintending those authors whereby he shapes their life, he trains them up, he oversees their education, he oversees their personality, he brings them through their human experiences right to the point that they're now perfectly suited 
like Moses, perfectly suited to write the Pentateuch. And then, but he left it in Moses' human origins for what he, what he writes. Okay? That's this idea of an organic inspiration. Tracing his roots to the Dutch predecessor, Herman Bavnik, or Bav Inc., I guess. I constantly mispronounce his name. Um, and uh, a lot of these quotes here. By the way, each one of these, and I'm not going to take the time today, but this can be a very slow chapter if at every single quote you go ahead and bring up the systematic theology of Burkhauer. Bring up his studies in dogmatics on the Holy Scriptures. And not only read the little snippet that Geisler quoted from, but read the pages leading up to that. Read the full context surrounding that. And you find, you validate very clearly that Geisler was not misrepresenting anything that, that uh, Burkhauer wrote. That he was very fair in every selection, every quote, and every snippet uh, is very much uh, consistent, providing an accurate view of Burkhauer every step of the way. So he rejects the orthodox view. You know, I read a paragraph like this and I like it. Every book of the Bible, every chapter, every word, every syllable, every letter is a direct utterance of the Most High. Okay? And I will I'll accept that. In the autographs, in the original autographs of the canon of Scripture, every jot, every tittle. Now we don't have the autographs and that's why we have to reconstruct them with text criticism. Anyway, Burkhauer says that's all nonsense. And uh, he says to, to claim that uh, it disregards all nuances of Scripture as, as though it were a string of divine or supernaturally revealed statements, ignoring the fact that God's Word has passed through humanity and has incorporated its service. He's just flat out wrong. We're not ignoring that for a minute. Okay? I think he's ignoring the, the God-breathed part of that while he stresses the, uh, the humanity. He says, inspiration is found in an intention. And right away, that should have raised a huge red flag because you've already had the chapter that talks about the philosophy of truth. What do we think truth is? Truth is not uh, defined by the intention. Truth is defined as that which conforms to reality. And so, yeah, he's right away off the rails here, just philosophically in the nature of truth. Inspiration is not found in intention. But this is fundamental to, uh, to their approach for the neo-evangelical view. Um, the human limitations. They're fine with the Bible having errors in it because human writings always have errors in it. And that's a very low view of Scripture. The Word became Scripture and as Scripture subjected itself to the fate of all writing. No, oh, stop right there. Hold on a minute. Okay? No. Yes, the word became scripture, it became written scripture, but it became written scripture through the divine agency of God's own work, his own breathing, his own inspiration, his own sovereignty in putting his word in a written form. And so it is not subjected to the fate of all writing because God's hand is still in it. Yeah. He chided fundamentalism for not admitting the full humanity of scripture. And we rightly throw it back at him and we chide him for not rightly admitting the full deity of Scripture. Anyway. Since for Burkhauer the Bible is not equated with the Word of God but possesses limitations to the point of error, he must adopt a form of divine accommodationism. This was something else that we touched on in an earlier chapter. When did Jesus ever accommodate error? When did he ever uh, go along to get along or play along with false views? He was constantly rebuking the religious leaders for getting it wrong. And he says, you're mistaken. You don't understand the scriptures or the power of God. Anyway, an accommodation to human error rather than the standard orthodox view of divine adaptation to human finitude. You can adapt to human finitude without error. And that's what the scriptures do. They adapt infinite truth to, to finite understanding uh, of humanity without putting error in there at all. Same thing with cultural accommodations, please. I mean, you don't see it. You don't see it from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Why do we think it, it takes place after the New Testament? It does not. The Bible is not designed to be accommodating the culture. It's designed to confront the culture. Scientific accommodations. 
And, and part of the problem, of course, with Burkauer and a lot of the, the fundamentalists, a lot of the folks in the early 20th century is they were trying to come to grips with uh, evolution, trying to come to grips with Darwin, trying to come to grips with a ton of science that was just brand new and cutting edge and whatever. And a lot of people were pressured into thinking that, oh, the Bible must have a bunch of mistakes because, um, you know, the Bible talks about humanity being 6,000 years or 7,000 years old and and uh, science tells us it's billions and billions and billions of years. And so there was a crisis and a lot of the theologians and a lot of people had to, had to deal with it. And some did a better job than others. But this uh, scientific accommodation approach is just sad. Same thing with historical accommodations. Sad. And a denying inerrancy. Sad. And yet even so, they're a little fuzzy on how they describe it. They, uh, they try to create a definition of, of error that is simply a, a mistake, uh, an inaccurate statement, an incorrect statement. And, and, and it's not the same level as one that is willfully deceptive and, and satanically deceptive. Or, or, and so somehow it's not sin, but it can still be factually incorrect. And that's not what God, God's Word says it is. And since God's Word says what it is, we accept what the testimony is of God's Word. Sometimes, you know, it depends, how ornery do you want to get when you talk to some of these people? Sometimes it's, it's curious to me that, um, have I shared this before, that you pick up one of their books, right? Doesn't Burkhauer want you to read his books literally? Of course he does. Let me just show you too. There's a, there's a vast library. He was not a slug. Okay? Let me just show you the... Uh, Burke Hour. There we go. Here's his systematic theology. 14 volumes. 14 volumes. Studies in dogmatics. And uh, the one we're looking at in this chapter is just right there. The Studies in Dogmatics Holy Scripture. That's one volume out of his 14 volume. The, the man was a hard worker. He was a scholar. He put a lot of research. He put a lot of writings. Um, you cannot call him a slog. It's just sad though that it was so shaped the way that it was through the neo-orthodox presuppositions. And it just, uh, it just led him. With, that's, here's the thing. Every, every element of, of deductive reasoning, if you start with a flawed premise, it's going to get you to a flawed conclusion even if your logic on the way is flawless. Okay? The premise itself is, uh, is wrong. Anyway, the good news is Burkhauer is in heaven now and he's got it all figured out. <laughs> all right. Let me get through some of these other ones. Worldview limitations. Yeah, Scripture bears the mark of the period and of the milieu in which it was written, and it shares in part these marks with a culture in which many ways was, was interrelated to that of Israel. This is true for writing, language, style, literary genre, ideas, conceptions, worldview. Okay, fine. So why is, is it still not divinely preserved? You're, you're forgetting the God part of the God-man origin of Scripture. <laughs> and then he tries to say, oh, authority is not diminished in any way. Yeah, you spend 20 years attacking the Scriptures and then tell me you're not, you're not diminishing the authority of the Scriptures at all? Of course you are. That's the, that's the whole point of why you're being motivated to do that. He also has struggles with the mythology elements. He uh, totally embraces the, the liberalism and the higher criticism there. All right, so that's enough on Burkhauer. His protege, Jack Rogers. Now at the time Geisler was writing this, Jack Rogers was still alive. So you had a birth date, you had a dash, and that's where it left off. In the years since then, uh, Jack Rogers has gone on to be with the Lord. He did die in uh, 2016, and so it was not that terribly long ago. And uh, he is now with the Lord. But he's going to have a very similar approach, very similar, uh, sad, uh, low, what I call a low regard for the, uh, the Word of God. And um, an author by the name of Harold Linzel, he wrote a book called The Battle for the Bible. It's, it's actually a useful book if, you, if you're interested. Uh, Fuller Seminary has been a leader in the move to a neo-evangelical view of Scripture. And so they're kind of the main villains in this regard as far as a school is concerned. 
movement began in the 1960s, the faculty split. We're going to see a lot of this in these chapters, faculty splits. And the issue they split over was inerrancy. It was, it was an approach to bibliology. And uh, those that opposed the move, evangelical conservatives, here's a, here's a good guys, Harold Lenzel, Carl Henry, Charles Woodbridge, Wilbur Smith, Gleason Archer, all good guys standing for the truth of the, of the nature of the Bible. And then uh, the move against inerrancy, here's the bad guys, including Daniel Fuller, George Ladd, Paul Jewett, and the president of the seminary, David Hubbard. The most significant work defending that terrible view was produced by uh, Jack Rogers. This AIB, you'll see repeatedly in the uh, rest of the chapter, the authority and interpretation of the Bible. And it's sad um, when it comes right down to it. The, um, yeah, God condescended, humbled, and accommodated himself to human categories of thought and speech. That's what this AIB is. Yes, but not to the point of error. Okay? Finitude, but not to the point of error. The nature of inspiration is not verbal and plenary. Rather, it is organic, meaning that the Bible is inspired as a whole, but not necessarily in all of its parts. So you put all 66 books together, you put all the chapters, the verses, and as a whole, we can say it contains the words of God, the Word of God, but it you can't say that all of it is, you can't say all scripture, you can't say every word, every jot and tittle. Jesus said that, but uh, Burkauer and Fuller and, and, uh, and these guys, they did not, they know better, or they think they do. All right, so he's got a better idea for inspiration. He again comes down to the idea of purpose, and uh, for the purpose which means that even if there are factual errors, if God accomplishes his purpose, then it's good to go. We're happy to have the Bible that we have because, you know, God's purpose was to kind of give a revelation for how, uh, you know, lost humans can have eternal life, and the Bible does that. And, and since the Bible does that, then we can uh, relax about all the other mistakes and problems and, and issues that we have with uh, the errors there. Anyway, it's, it's sad. It is historically irresponsible to claim that for 2,000 years Christians have believed that the authority of the Bible entails a modern concept of inerrancy in scientific and historical details. Well, no, it's not historically irresponsible. If anybody's historically irresponsible, it's the crowd that started changing 2,000 years of, of bibliology just because of the 19th century destructive introduction of uh, Darwin and Big Bang and everything else, okay? The only reason why we have these neo-Orthodox, neo-evangelical and liberal views is because of the uh, secular scientific and secular historical details, okay? No, we don't have any problem. We still hold on to inerrancy. It's God-breathed, it's inspired, God wrote it, it's eternal, and we're fine with that. Anyway, that's kind of where they're off the rails and they're not coming back, I don't think. So yeah, the purpose of Scripture. Purpose determines meaning, and since the purpose of the Bible is judged to be unilaterally salvific, one must overlook minor factual errors in history and science in fa favor of its central saving purpose. So I mean, essentially, and, and honestly, you guys know better than this because you know um, all Scripture is God-breathed. You know that... that um, it, every passage is profitable, but not every passage is salvific. Okay, you, you don't really like, uh, Jim Myers had to bring up that parbar verse out of First Chronicles this morning, it made me laugh, right? Because honestly, we don't know what a parbar even is. But it's in First Chronicles, and it causes a lot of debates. But I mean, you have passages that, that clearly are not salvific, and, and so you just throw it away and act like, well, it's not part of the purpose of the Bible, so, you know, who cares? Uh, it's just crazy. No, you understand the Bible totally, every verse, every passage in context. Why is it there? All right, why is it there? They totally embrace the higher criticism, which we mostly reject. With a focus on purpose, not fact, he's able to accommodate all the liberal rejection of the Bible. He's fine embracing it. Uh, from Bavinck's perspective, Scripture was not meant 
to give us a technically correct scientific information. Okay, I agree. What's your point? I can agree with that statement and still not embrace your approach to bibliology. That's just insane. Why? Why? Okay, so yes, we don't have the creation account in Genesis that might uh, come to us in the language of a 21st century, uh, you know, uh, physicist. That's fine. It doesn't have to come with that kind of language. I wouldn't expect it to come with that kind of language. If somebody back then would have written with that kind of language, he probably would have been uh, killed as a, as a sorcerer or some, you know, weirdo. <laughs> okay, obviously. The, the language of the Bible was written in the, in the day and age in which it was written. We're not, we don't have a problem with that. Why uh, does, does that become so uh, definitive for these guys that decide that on that basis they have to reject inerrancy or inspiration? So Rogers clearly rejected the traditional orthodox view of B.B. Warfield. Here's a good guy, okay? Um, again, I'm trying to give you these names, good guy, bad guy. Um, now I've got to start being more careful because a lot of the good guys we're going to see in the upcoming pages, um, we can still call them good guys in bibliology. We can still call them good guys in inspiration and inerrancy and bibliology and, and all of that, okay? Many of them are going to be pretty flaming um, Calvinists, okay? And so we're going to, when we get to the Calvinism discussion, uh, we won't be calling them good guys anymore, okay? We'll have a different label for them. Um, Anyway, B.B. Warfield was wonderful in the inspiration of Scripture on inerrancy. The Bible is factually inerrant in the original manuscripts. As in, well, so he rejects it because he says, well, you can't prove that. You, you, you tell me that the autographs are inerrant, but then I can't check you out because we don't have the autographs. Okay, now hold on a second. We can recreate the autographs. That's the whole point to textual criticism. The exercise is recreating the autographs, at least for most textual critics. Some are abandoning that, by the way, and uh, they don't care about the autographs. They're just trying to get to the, the chain of transmission that gets them to a Byzantine majority. But that's a discussion for a different day. Anyway, Rogers, bad guy. Uh, Warfield, good guy. Is this bugging you like it's bugging me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let me try to... Uh, what can I do? I'm going to do that, which is going to ruin the thing that... Uh, recording desk needs, so I'll have to turn that back on again. And then I'm going to start it back up again. I'll listen to the little ding-a-ling. Okay, now hopefully that's going to stop the flickering there. Now I've got to restart this for the recording desk. So that should make Maury happy. Are you seeing my screen again? All right. And hopefully we'll be done with those flickers. All right. Lord willing and rapture pending. That fixed it. Okay. More good guys. Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield. Um, they're very Calvinistic. Okay. So I'll have, I'll have a different estimation of them in, in some upcoming chapters. But for today, for this chapter, when it comes to inspiration and, and bibliology, uh, these guys are solid. God breathed inspired word of God, plenary, verbal plenary inspiration, solid guys. And so start learning these names, okay? And each one of them has a, you got, a, Hodge has a systematic theology, and you can link to that in Logos and read everything he wrote there. These guys are associated with Princeton, okay? And they're called the Princetonian School. And uh, yeah, Rogers wants to throw that out. He says, Aristotle in logic is uh, outmoded. So he proceeded to, in a revisionist philosophy of the church history, to reinterpret the past in favor of his new uh, neo-evangelical view. So anyway, Rogers uh, tried to defend it. He's off the rails. All right, now we get to C.S. Lewis. Were you surprised by this part? Yeah, yeah I was too. Okay. And, uh, and it's good to know it. Bookmark this chapter. Just have it on hand. Refer to it every now and then. Because it's been so many years, I, I, I forget, right? But then somebody comes to me and they're all excited because they're reading a, a theology book by C.S. Lewis. And I say, well, if it's not Narnia, um, I just advise some caution here, okay? <laughs> okay? The, the, the fiction is fun, but uh, be on guard. And this chapter will tell you why. 
And then occasionally, if I'm rusting on it, they say, well, what do you have against C.S. Lewis? I said, I don't remember, but I put him in the bad guy category of the, the last class that I taught on. <laughs> on. All right, and then I have to go back and remind myself. And this chapter does a good job with it. So, um, of course, and, and he's, he's regarded today as a legend of, of Christian apologetics, right? He's the paradigm, he's the pinnacle, he's the... I mean, mere Christianity is practically the 67th book of the Bible because it's so, it's so God-breathed and inspired. Anyway, God bless him. He too is with the Lord now, so he knows better. Um, but yeah, his theological views um, combine a, and really it's a little bit contradictory, a little bit, um, question over there? We've got to get you a microphone then. All right. We forgot to prepare this before class started. We're really rusty. Yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, I have a question about Lewis, uh-huh. right? So we're talking about him right now. So, and we're seeing some of the um, some of the the not so great parts about Lewis. He's in a bad guy category. That's like, it's crazy for me because I, I I read Mere Christianity, so. Yeah. Um, when we read, like, say in the future, if we read C.S. Lewis Literary Works and um, be on guard for some stuff, well, what's some stuff that he got right that you like about C.S. Lewis? Oh, could I'll you briefly think about that? There, okay. I mean, st- he got a lot of stuff right. We'll see some of it here in this chapter. You know, um, yeah. I would, I would put him as an evangelical. Um, yeah, he got things right. He got, certainly got substitutionary atonement right when he had Aslan dying in place of the, you know, laying down his life and in redeeming uh, the, the four kids there. But I like that part of the book. That was a good one. Yeah. All right, well, let's go through this. Uh, contradictory elements of orthodox, liberal, neo-orthodox, and new evangelical views. Yeah, he's kind of a, a hodgepodge. He's like a potluck of, of all of these views. Um, clearly, neither evangelical nor liberal. He's really a hybrid of, uh, of several different things. But a neo-orthodox approach to inspiration. The voice of God could be heard through the errant record of the Old Testament. The origin of the message was divine, but the human pipeline was often terribly polluted. He really disliked the God of violence and war and the ugliness of the Old Testament. He really uh, had a, a visceral rejection of the, uh, the, the Psalms, uh, many of the the uh, psalms that call for vengeance and so forth. And uh, yeah, so he struggled with the Old Testament on that. Um, Adopted a theistic evolutionary view of the origin of Scripture, believing that human beings develop gradually and naturally until God infuses a human soul into it, thus stamping his image on it. This kind of too, by the way, a form of this was what uh, Theme started to try to present when he talked about soul format in the, uh, in the fetus until the point that he finally finishes that soul format with a completed soul at the Nashama breath of life at physical human birth. Um, it's kind of a, a, a twist on this same concept right here, and neither one, I think, is defensible uh, related to that. Well, we'll have more to say on that when we get to anthropology in, uh, in volume two, I think it is. Anyway, more uh, divine superintendents, more things there. Lewis's belief in the divine authority of Scripture was severely modified by his acceptance of negative literary criticism of it. And, and I don't blame him. This was the universe he traveled in. He was, a, he was an academic. He was a, a university professor. And if, if, if you're saturated in that realm and all of the experts are telling you this, it's hard to go against that flow. Okay. And so he swallowed it, and he embraced it. And then this was the problem with Bavink, and this was the problem with uh, Burkauer and some of these other names. And so once you take that, uh, you just got to reject it out of hand and say, no, I'm not going there. Okay? Question? So I have another question about Lewis. Do you think World War I affected his mentality about God's violence of the Old Testament and, and the... No, uh, I think he was of- developing that anyway. Okay. I think that was without, even without World War One, he was developing that anyway. Okay. Okay. If Thank I had you. to, if I had to suspect that, he has no problem with an errant Bible. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, myths, and of course, he, ex- he. This was his expertise. 
he, he, he majored in mythology and he majored in, in this and even invented his own mythology. And so it kind of impacted how he saw the, uh, the mythical elements of, uh, of the Bible. Anyway, it's, it's a sad approach to uh, the Scripture, the errant nature of the Bible. I think Geisler is being very fair, quoting him accurately and disputing those points. Okay. Got a follow-up on that? Uh, just a curiosity. Uh, since, I guess, Lewis and Tolkien were friends, do you mm -hmm. know, was, was Tolkien in the same category in his views of, of the Bible? Or? Uh, Tolkien really separated his, his Christianity from his mythology. And so he was very much, um, when he wrote Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings and all that, it was, it was very much in the mythical part of his life, not in his Roman Catholic part of his life. And, and he really separated those out quite well. And they had discussions on that. Um, Lewis wanted Tolkien to have more allegory to his writing. And Tolkien told Lewis, he says, I despise allegory. He was absolutely, he held it with such low regard and utter detesting of allegory he, that it, it's kind of amusing today when people try to find allegory in Lord of the Rings. And, and Tolkien himself said that he loathed it, he despised it, he would no, have no part of it. So, and then, and then so he didn't take to that criticism very well. They, they would read each other's drafts and they were friends. There were two others, there were four of them all together that met at the, uh, the Eagle and something pub in Oxford. And uh, anyway, Tolkien did not take kindly to, to uh, his criticism. And so then he returned it. He thought that Narnia was just uh, childish and immature and not really worthy of a full fantasy thing. And okay, well, so be it <laughs> as far as that goes. But. All right. Yeah, here we go. The fanatic and homicidal Hebrews. So here's, I mean, this is Lewis's own disdain for uh, these uh, imprecatory psalms, right? I mean, we, we, clearly they're, they're, they're harsh, you know, and, and we struggle. I mean, I get it in the, the, that uh, we wouldn't offer those prayers ourselves as church age believers. Uh, as that David offered, that the Old Testament offered, okay? We pray for our enemies and love for those that persecute you. We don't want to dash their babies' heads against rocks in, in our normal prayer life. So he calls it here, yeah, fanatic and homicidal Hebrews. Um, talks about the contemptible Psalms, which he really just said, let's kind of ignore them, pretend they're not there. Well, he can't do that. All Scripture is God-breathed rejected the traditional authorship, accepted all of the myths of the post-exilic accumulation of literature and all this silly stuff. And, and we can call it silly now because here we are 120 years later, right? Here we are way down the road looking back with a lot of hindsight. Uh, very faithful men have gone through. JEDP has been so debunked and so destroyed that uh, only the true believers still hold to it, okay? The ultra-liberals that demand that it has to be true because they say so. Um, but, you know, in his day, in the early 20th century, when it was considered to be cutting-edge research, it was considered to be the, the latest, greatest understanding of, of biblical revelation, I, I get it. It was a tough road to, to deal with. The Hebrews, like other people, had mythology, but as they were the chosen people, so their mythology was the chosen mythology. Oh, my goodness. Okay. The mythology chosen by God to be the vehicle of the earliest sacred truths, the first step in that process, which ends in the New Testament, where truth has finally has become completely historical. And so, you know, he'll accept the historical Jesus, he'll accept the death on the cross, he'll accept all of the, the basis for our salvation and, and resurrection, um, but he can't accept the Old Testament as being, that's, that's myth, that's not history. And it's, uh, it's pretty sad. All right, accepting theistic evolution. Again, you're an academic, uh, academic and you're surrounded by these guys. All right, this next table is good. With the exception of C.S. Lewis' more liberal and neo-orthodox thoughts, because remember, he was kind of a hybrid, but this really stands as a good contrast between our view, which is the evangelical view, and the neo-evangelical view. We accept that the Bible is true in whole and in all of its parts. 
as opposed to just true as, as a whole, but not in all its parts. Uh, true spiritually and scientifically, they say, nope, it's only true spiritually. It's not always scientifically true. Right, we, we deny that. True in what it intends and what it affirms. They say it's true in what it intends, not in all that it affirms. They can have false affirmations as long as it's true in its intent. It's, it's just so schizoid. Truth is found in correspondence. They say truth is found in intention. All right. Then he wraps up this chapter here by saying some positive things. He's far too kind. I am never that kind with, with these guys. But he finds the, the silver lining and the, the, the bonus points and gives them credit for this and credit for that. All of this is not to say, this, this hit me so hard, I made it extra large type and I underlined it with, with double underlines and bold. All of this is not to say that there are no serious problems with a neo-evangelical view of Scripture. You think? Okay. There are many. Some of the more significant ones will be briefly examined. And so after he says the nice things he had to say about them, now he hits them hard with the legitimate critiques. And it's, it's a claim that's contrary to what the Bible claims for itself. It's contrary to what the church fathers said and the reformers said. It's contrary. It's based on a fallacious view of truth. We can reject that as a non-starter. Truth is what conforms to reality, not uh, the intention of the, of the author. That's a tremendous we- uh, weakness. It undermines the divine authority of the Bible. Absolutely it does. So, this is how he concludes it. The new evangelical view is neither new nor evangelical. <laughs> and I agree. All right. In short, the neo-evangelical view of Scripture is biblically ungrounded, theologically unsound, and philosophically incoherent. That's a wonderful statement. I think you'll find it on your quiz. All right. So other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play, right? I mean, this is, this is the, uh, the conclusion to the neo-evangelicals. There's your bibliography, your references there. Burkauer, bad guy. Christensen, eh, okay, he was documenting Lewis. Geisler, good guy. Hannah, great guy, I've met Hannah. John Hannah, um, church history professor at uh, Dallas Seminary. Clyde Kilby, C.S. Lewis, Jack Rogers, bad guy. And all right. Now the fun ones, okay? We've been waiting to get to the good guys. All right. Evangelicals on the Bible. And for the purposes of this uh, class, this is us. We, we're, we're here in this chapter, okay? I don't know that we'll keep calling ourselves evangelicals 10 years from now. Uh, the, the term is really getting morphed into something kind of ugly. So um, anyway, I know some pastor friends of mine don't even call themselves evangelical anymore uh, because of the, the negative association. Some, even though they're still free grace, they don't like to call themselves free grace. Again, because of stupid things all right well yeah so we're we're in good shape here's some good guys and a lot of these are calvinists okay we're going to give them full credit for having a high view of scripture we're going to get we're going to give them all the props they deserve for being for defending inerrancy and inspiration and all the high view of scripture that they have and then we'll, uh, we'll tear them apart, you know, in a couple months when we get to their Calvinism, and we'll address that in the uh, soteriology volume that we get to. But for now, here's Turretin, good guy, professor at Geneva, and uh, he's going to spell out the historical orthodox view of the nature and extent of Scripture. So the, the origin, boom, because it comes from God, must be authentic and divine. God breathe. There's your Theopanustos reference from Timothy. The nature of Scripture is infallible. It's inerrant. Do we have real contradictions in the Scriptures? No. There are apparent contradictions, but you can reconcile every single one of them. There, there is not any, not even one, irreconcilable contradiction in the Word of God. Are there inexplicable passages which cannot be explained and made to harmonize? He says he denies that. Why? Because when the divinity of the scriptures is proved, its infallibility necessarily follows. God is perfect and he cannot err. There are not even small errors in the Bible. Yeah, preach it, Turretin. (laughs) All right, amen, I'm with you.
the uh, anti-legia, as they call it, uh, apparent contradictions or surface level contradictions. Um, they are apparent, not real. They are to be understood only with respect to us who cannot comprehend and perceive the agreement everywhere, but not in the thing itself. And so you got to harmonize it. You got to work it out. You got to find the solutions because God does not err and God does not lie. Scriptures are inspired of God. The word of God cannot lie. That's what it comes down to. This is why the Bible cannot err because God's not a liar. Only the original text is inerrant. Of course, you can have manuscript variants that will creep in and give you problems. The exclusive authority of Scripture, sola scriptura, we're not going to go to uh, church tradition or authority of popes or church councils or anything like that. It's what does the Bible say? And if a church council is, is at odds with the Bible, then the church council is wrong. The Bible is, is eternal truth. Scripture alone is the supreme judge of controversy. Now, preservation of scriptures. I enjoyed this section. There's more to be done on it. Um, I do. There's a couple of re more recent books on preservation that I found very useful. Um, I didn't prepare them here today, but I'll, I'll bring a list. Uh, one in particular, it's a very short one, a little green booklet that you can read in 20 minutes. And it's, it's one of the most concise, clearest, uh, beautiful descriptions of preservation that, uh, that I've ever read. but I might find it in Logos. I do have it. I'll find it after class. All right. Anyway, how did he provide the scriptures? He did not save the autographs for us. That He could have if he wanted to. He didn't want to. That much is clear. How did he preserve them? Preserve them in the way that he did preserve them through thousands and thousands of manuscripts and copies and shreds and, and things that allow for the autographs to be recreated. Copies are not inspired. All right, so yeah, Turretin's a great guy. Jonathan Edwards. Some people think the, uh, the most brilliant mind to ever stand upon the North American continent was, uh, was Jonathan Edwards. And um, Puritan theologian, total genius, um, significant figure of the Great Awakening. He believed the Bible was the very word of God. If, uh, if the Bible said it, God said it. That was his view. That's our view. He did have a, an unfortunate choice of phrases when he talked about the Israelitish church. Okay? That he wrote the law and the history of the Israelitish church. That's going to kind of betray part of the Reformed Calvinist failure there with uh, replacement theology. But otherwise, he's very solid here on inspiration. Sometimes he'll use a term dictation, but it's not how a lot of the folks use the idea of dictation, so relax about that. Um, he does refer to the writers as penmen of the Holy Spirit, but he's not talking about the mechanical dictation that's often thought of today, whereby God just took possession of their bodies and turned their minds off, and he used them to mechanically uh, put uh, quills to parchment and write the Bible out. God did not do that. He has a good balance for the God part and the man part of the Bible. And he thought it was beautiful. All right, and then we get to the old Princetonians, 1812 to 1936. And there was a huge split, and the split was over liberalism. And the faithful men were forced out, okay? The faithful men that held to inerrancy and inspiration, and they were forced out. And so Princeton went completely liberal as, as a result of their victory, uh, their sad victory on this... Uh, on this occasion. Anyway, Whitfield was supposed to come and assume his post at Princeton, never was able to, so um, the first professor in the seminary was A.A. A. Archibald Alexander. Keep that in mind. You're going to see that name again, um, but you're going to see it abbreviated A.A. A. Okay, but the first professor of the seminary was Archibald Alexander. There's his lifetime, 1772 to 1851. He and his protege, his pupil, colleague, was Charles Hodge. Uh, Hodge was a little bit younger, born in 1797, uh, died in 1878. So those two the, were kind of the, 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 the preeminent ones early, Archibald Alexander and Charles Hodge. 
his pupil and colleague, became founders of the Princeton Theology and Architects of Reformed Confessionalism at the seminary. And uh, here's a quote here related to their legacy. And uh, yeah, as they were fighting with uh, fundamentalists and fighting with the Darwin uh, damage and the Wilhausen damage and all this stuff, man, what a battlefield. These men were succeeded in turn by the son of Charles Hodge. And you want to know how close Charles Hodge was with, Alexa with Archibald Alexander? Named him, yeah. The, the A.A. Hodge is Archibald Alexander Hodge. Okay? You don't get those names coincidentally. So Archibald Alexander Hodge, clearly named after his mentor, Archibald Alexander. So this is how you have Charles Hodge and A.A. A. Hodge and uh, father, son, and you keep them straight. But you, can't con you have to call him A.A. A. Hodge so that you don't confuse him with the original Archibald Alexander, okay? Because that was a generation prior. And then there's B.B. Warfield, who I think was fine calling him Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, but maybe the A.A. A. was so, uh, so trendy that they went ahead and went with B.B. For, uh, for Warfield, I don't know. And then Macon, oh my goodness, J. Gresham Macon. And uh, all the way up until 1937. He was the latest, the youngest, the one that was absolutely forced out there. Maintained the institution's reputation for unbending but erudite conservatism down to 1936, when both the seminary and the denomination were disrupted by conservative secessions. Basically, the faithful ones walked out and said, that's it, you can have it. And they gave up their school and they gave up their denomination. The Presbyterians have been liberal ever since, okay? Princeton's been a train wreck ever since. Charles Hodge. Anyway, solid guys on the origin of Scripture, the nature of Scripture. We would be very harmonious and like-minded. Opposition to evolution. He wrote a penetrating book entitled, What is Darwinism? Well, flat out, it's atheism. What else do you want to know? <laughs> okay, why waste time? Doesn't mean that Mr. Darwin himself and all who adopt his views are atheists, but it does mean that his theory is atheistic, that the exclusion of design from nature is tantamount to atheism. Of course it is. Ludicrous to say otherwise. So, belief in naturalistic evolution had a devastating influence on the historicity and authority of the Bible. And... Uh, Saw it coming and tried to hold it off, but they were the losers in the, uh, in the warfare there at Princeton. So then you get AA and BB. In the wake of Origin of the Species and the higher critical theories of uh, Graf and Wellhausen, the great heroes of this next generation were AA and BB. They wrote a book called Inspiration, became something of a normative statement. In fact, we still use it to this day. It has come down through some successive uh, generations, but essentially our doctrine of inerrancy is the direct offspring of, uh, of BB and AA and what they did in 1881. So instead of the idea that the Bible contains the Word of God, they flat out said, no, the Bible is the Word of God. Every word, verbal, plenary inspiration of Scripture. Fine with the human elements, but that does not diminish the divine. The obvious humanness of Scripture eliminates any notion of mechanical or verbal dictation. I mean, it's just dumb. I mean, if God turned their brains off and just used them as puppets to write the Scripture, or if he gave them word for word what he wanted them to say... Why was God trying to imitate the, the human foibles, the human uh, idiosyncrasies of each of the human authors, right? The, the medical background of Luke or the, the, uh, all the legal elements that Paul throws in there or any of the other things that are so clearly observed any time you look at them. Each sacred writer was by God specially formed, endowed, educated, providentially conditioned. And then, don't stop there. That's where the one crowd wants to stop. And then supplied with knowledge naturally, supernaturally, and spiritually conveyed so that he and he alone could and freely would produce his allotted part. No scripture is his own interpretation, but men were moved along, carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it's verbal, it's plenary, factually inerrant. 
They reject the destructive higher criticism. <coughs> I think they did it the same way we do it. We look at their presuppositions and say, hold on now. You, you have a fundamental uh, rejection of all things miraculous. There's, there's no point in doing that. You're trying to create a natural explanation for the supernatural Bible. There's no reason for that. And so really it gave birth to this thing called ICBI, the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. And 1978, so here's my lifetime, okay, most of our lifetime, not a couple of you. In any event, the um, International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, Norm Geisler was a a signatory on that, and then the follow-up product. So here's their short statement about God and about the Scriptures. Wonderful. And then the longer statement, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy with 19 articles. This would be a fun class just to work through one item by item and go through these and teach them to, you know, in a home Bible study at some point. It's a great... And, and it's phrased with a we affirm and we deny. Constantly, back and forth, back and forth. Here's what we affirm and here's what we deny. And, and we're not apologizing. We flat out affirm what we affirm and we flat out deny what we deny. So we affirm that the Holy Scriptures are to be received as the authoritative Word of God. I can affirm that seven days a week. We deny that the Scripture received their authority from the church, tradition, or any other human source. Yep, I'll deny that till the day I die. Okay? And each one of these articles has a we affirm and a we deny. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's exquisite the way these are spelled out. So this is from the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. I think they're working to reproduce this and expand it a little bit for the 21st century. I don't know why. I think it stands fine just in the way it was first drafted in 1978. They also published a commentary on the 19 articles. As if the affirmations and denials couldn't speak for themselves. Go ahead and throw a commentary on top of it. Then the ETS, which sadly Geisler used to be the president of and then resigned from, and they started to, they started to go liberal. They started to go in, into some squishy realms and Geisler was having none of it. And again, it, it just seems like the battle just comes again and again and again. Satan never rests. And if there's a faithful group out there, he's going to start going after that group until they get wishy-washy. Anyway, this is described here, the Evangelical Theological Society why it is the liberals attack them and hate them. We're fine accepting the supernatural. They have to reject supernaturalism. They're fine accepting alien philosophical views. And we're like, excuse me? Why are you injecting that alien philosophical view into the Bible? Where did that come from? Why are you imposing that onto the text? These baseless philosophical premises. I thought this was interesting. This note about Albright. I didn't know this about Albright. A uh, former critic of Scripture, noted archaeologist William F. Albright, summed up his own journey from a more liberal to a more conservative view. That's always fun. When you hear about somebody who started off in the wrong camp and then God brought him to the light. He brought him to truth and brought him to the, the more biblical view on the authority of Scripture. And uh, Albright finally got there, and I'm glad he did. He says, authority of Scripture is a valid theological principle, whereas the school of Wellhausen is only one of many ideological systems. The school of Wellhausen is, remember that? The higher criticism, the destructive Germans, okay? And he calls it an ideological system. It's not theology, it's ideology imposed upon your theology. Built on arbitrary philosophical postulates and baseless historical presuppositions. (laughs) That's a very academic way of saying it's full of Nothing, okay? It's a bunch of garbage. Guys likes to quote Colossians 2.8 a lot. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which is most philosophies, hollow and deceptive. It's not all philosophy. You know, we have a love of wisdom. We, have a, we should have a biblical philosophy, a, go- a godly biblical philosophy. Anyway, yeah, all these villains, Bacon, Hobbes, Spinoza, Hume, Kant, or Kant, I should say, Kierkegaard, Hegel. 
And time and time again, I mean, it's almost hyper redundant at this point, but the anti supernaturalism, evolutionism, progressivism, hmm. existentialism. Thank you, Kierkegaard. All right. So, yep, this is where we are. And plenty of reasons to defend it, pl plenty of reasons to hold to it. There you go. All right. Here's your bibliology. Any questions on this chapter, chapter 23? Oh, here's the uh, references here. Um, Norman Geisler, Beware of Philosophy, A Warning to Biblical Exegetes, published in the ETS Journal in 1999. Uh, General Introduction of the Bible, he co-wrote that with William Nix. Um, Inerrancy, great text from 1979. He was the general editor of that text. Even, I don't, I've never read this one. Errancy, it's philosophical roots. That'd be kind of a fun one. I've never... Never encountered that one. Of course, there's Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, all the C.S. Lewis. All right. And then B.B. Warfield. My favorite B.B. Warfield is on, uh, it's on Christology. The person and work of Christ. Wow. Okay. And you could forget that he's a hardcore Calvinist. You can just read The Person and Work of Christ by B.B. Warfield, and it's so um, devotional and intimate and tender, and obviously uh, Warfield had a, had, a, had a profound love for his Savior. And it just comes out in... Uh, that was the first thing I ever read by Warfield, and, uh, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. All right, well, we're ready for chapter 24. Ready for the Bible thumpers, Okay. Which is us part of the time, too, okay? We, we actually struggle. I, I told you, we are chapter 23, but we're kind of also a little bit of chapter 24. And, uh, and that's worth a discussion, too. Because, again, some of these labels came about during the midst of the conflicts that were rising, okay? And uh, at the time of the fundamentalist controversy, at the time when... Um, when the Princetonians were, were much more reasonable and measured and, and they, were, they were fighting their battles, but they were very gracious and academic and clear on how they were doing it, the fundamentalists were fire-breathing and, and they weren't at all academic and they weren't at all uh, gentle or gracious in their rejection of, of Darwin and, and, and everything else. And so uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And then it led to a point that even though we were like-minded with them, we were not harmonious because of the, the, their attitudes and their behavior and their, their techniques and their, just their, their hostility to things. It really led to, uh, to even a split on our side of the, of the, uh, of the fight. So, um, and they're still around today, by the way. They're still very active. You can find them. Uh, in fact, there's one right down the street from here that is uh, fundamentalist, King James only, Bible thumping, fire breathing, Baptist Church. Okay. Now, um, they are correct, though. We, we can be their cheerleaders on inspiration. We can be their cheerleaders on the inspiration of Scripture and, and everything related to Revelation. Okay. Many contemporary theologians would call themselves fundamentalists, accept the same views expressed by the evangelical position. So there's a lot of overlap. Both groups, evangelical and fundamentalist, can point back to Hodge, Hodge, Warfield, and Macon, part of the group in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries called the historic fundamentalists. Among the rest who call themselves fundamentalists, there are at least two main views. And this is where it started to branch off. And then we had to, the good guys had to stop and say, oh, please, don't take us there. What are you doing? So the, uh, the verbal dictation position and the inspired King James Version position which, have you ever met these guys? We were talking earlier, you said you've never met one. Oh, just wait till you meet the first King James only person that comes and calls you satanic and says you're being, you're being led astray by this Alexandrian cult and they've got all this code language for why the New American Standard and the New King James and all these texts are, uh, are so evil. 
All right. Historic fundamentalism arose out of the controversy between conservatives and liberals in the Presbyterian Church. Their seminary at Princeton held the standard Orthodox view of Scripture. Okay, so they're just like the evangelicals, these fundamentals, fundamentalists, they also were on the right side of, of those questions. The position is essentially the one that we just got through describing in chapter 23. The Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant written word of God, and inspiration is both verbal and plenary. In brief, the Bible is both God's word and man's word. Errors exist only in copies, not in the originals. Everything the Bible affirms, whether in theology or science and history, is without error. Okay, so why are they not in the evangelical camp? Why, why did they get set apart as something different than evangelical? Why do we have a label for them now called the fighting fundies, right, or the fundamentalists? Those who are currently called fundamentalists by themselves or by the non-fire-breathing, rabid, bug-eyed kooks of evangelical churches. Um, yeah. Now, th there can be some variety. They're not all monolithic. They're not clones of one another, but they have so much in common that uh, th the label fits more often than not. All right? And uh, from the standard evangelical view all the way to this verbal dictation position and then the, the bizarre King James only view even to the point that the, the 16th century Anglican text is what's God breathed and inspired. That it fixed all the problems of the, the Greek and Hebrew flawed manuscripts. Okay? Which is just bonkers. All right. So, typical charge by non-evangelicals against most forms of contemporary fundamentalism is not accurate. So we want to be fair. We don't want to misrepresent them. No knowledgeable proponent under the label fundamentalist confesses to believe in the mechanical dictation view. Which, by the way, that's the Muslim view. Islam holds to that. That, uh, that when Gabriel was revealing the Quran to Muhammad that he had to take control of his faculties and had to reveal in such a way with a mechanical dictation view because Muhammad was illiterate. And if you pick an illiterate co-author, um, you got to kind of take take the wheel and, and drive for him because he can't he can't do it himself. Anyway, no God um, is not an Islamic view. It has God dictating word for word to biblical writers who served as mere secretaries and recorded precisely what they received. Even those few fundamentalists who are favorable to the term verbal dictation refuse to call it mechanical dictation. And I think even the term dictation is problematic. That's not how the, the inspiration was motivated. It was breathed um, through the human agents, not um, dictated to them. Anyway, so yeah, here's where they got it. Here's part of the, the uh, claim here. Unfortunately, the fundamentalist claim is often understood as each word being inspired atomistically in and of itself. Okay. Gets a little technical here on this. Um, and yes, some of the reformers did use the word dictation, but they're not talking mechanical dictation as it's used today. Right, not a mechanical word-for-word -word kind of dictation that ignores the personality and vocabulary of the biblical authors. Sometimes they use less than ideal illustrations. We talked about that earlier too. All right, fact of the matter is almost all fundamentalists deny the mechanical dictation view of Scripture and very few even speak of any kind of verbal dictation. And yet, here's the most famous American evangelist, John R. Rice, the exception to the rule, okay? And since this was John R. Rice's view, this is what every fundamentalist out there gets, uh, gets plastered with. The verbal dictation view of John R. Rice. And I had no idea he was still alive in 1980. Isn't you know that something? Okay, so in, in our lifetime, some of us, all right? In uh, 1980 is when he went to be with the Lord. Now, yeah, he's the prime example. He embraced it. All Scripture is God-breathed. It is the Scripture itself is breathed out from God. If God gave all the words in the Bible, then is that not dictation? He did hasten to say it's not mechanical. It was just verbal. And then he tries to, uh, he tries to distinguish there. 
We admit gladly that there is a human side of the Bible in its style, language, composition, history, and culture. So how did God get a word-for-word verbal dictation recorded and yet still use different styles in biblical writers? Ah, planning. God planned it ahead of time so that each one was chosen before he was born and fitted to be the instrument God wanted to use. He shaped his birth, he shaped his childhood, he shaped his life, he shaped everything leading up to the point of writing so that each of those authors would have the style and vocabulary and personalities that God wanted to use when he verbally dictated those texts. I don't know, some of these are uh, more esoteric than others. Rice rejected all higher criticism of the Bible. And he's right. I would agree with him on his statement here. Higher criticism tends to sit in judgment on the Bible and let poor, sinning, frail, ignorant, mortal men pass judgment on the Word of God. Instead of a fallible, mutilated, divine message, Rice held to the verbally dictated, inerrant book that is the Bible. But here's another category of fundamentalists. And these guys, like I say, they're right down the street. Um... Most fundamentalists were reared on the King James Version of the Bible. And really, what other Bible were they going to have in the 1890s? What other Bible were they going to have in the early 1900s? Okay? The American Standard Version did come out in 1901, but the fundamentalists didn't trust it. They didn't, uh, they didn't feel like, like uh, it, it, that the King James needed to be replaced. Why replace it? Okay? They looked at it with suspicion. No, that was a different one. Yeah, the adulterer's Bible where they left the word not out of the thou shalt commit adultery. Yeah, that's a bad addition. Yeah, which you can see if you want to go look at it in the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. You can see the adulterer's Bible there. The king ordered them all destroyed and obviously they weren't because they, they had to save at least one for the Museum of the Bible. You have a question? All right, let's get you on the microphone. <laughs> okay, uh, so my question is, so you, you said that they really didn't have a whole lot of other um, translations besides different versions of the King James because it was updated several times. Right. Can we, is there a degree of empathy we can have for them, especially in the early 1900s of oh, not sure. trusting? Because aren't there new Bibles that may be good Bibles that we may not be so sure about right now? Like uh, Quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And then so maybe, I don't blame them, and, and in a sense, um, and, and Geiser describes it well, the King James translators use the beauty, rhythm, cadence, and descriptive power possible through this Elizabethan style to produce an enduring and endearing rendition of the Word of God, and, and that's undeniable. As, as, a, as a product of literature, the King James Bible is as a monument. I mean, it's amazing that it stood for, you know, the, the 400 years that it stood, um, but, you know, like all language that changes, you know, if you're trying to read Shakespeare at the dinner table to, to give your children some culture, you're going to get laughed at, <laughs> okay? The Elizabethan English language um, ha- is now very, very debated. And he talks about some of this that is just now the polar opposite of what words used to mean va- based on what they mean now and why you do have to update language, why, and they themselves did give later editions of the King James with some adjustments. Um, but also because, fundamentally, they didn't have a good grasp on Hebrew when they translated the, the King James. And, and their much better understanding of Hebrew came along later, and better manuscripts came along later. So, um, and, and today, of course, we've got access to the Dead Sea Scrolls that they didn't have. We've got, we've got a lot of things available today that must be considered as part of your Bible translation. They didn't have any of that in 1611. Anyway. Yes, when you idolize an aesthetically pleasing translation, okay? Yes, it's aesthetic, it, aesthetically pre- pleasing. It sounds great. It's majestic. It's, it's got the thundering diction that it has. But you can't turn that text into an idol. Freezing the truth of the original Hebrew and Greek text, even updating the Hebrew and Greek. Here's Peter Ruckman. Now, I forget. I think he, does he have an Austin connection? Was he from Austin, Texas? I forget, Ruckman and some of his followers, produced several works on the topic, including, yeah, he was was a huge King James-only guy. Also, uh, Gail Ripplinger. She's just vicious in some of her ugly things. New Age Bible, 
which Bible is God's word. If I, if I ever recommend, the only James White book I will ever recommend to you is this one here, The King James Only Controversy. He does a masterful job ripping apart the King James Only cultists. Okay? And I appreciated that. And I like that. It's the first James White thing I ever read. Later on I learned that he hates dispensationalists and he hates uh, us. And, and, and even though I liked his takedown on the King James Only people, I have no appreciation for his attacks against us. And so, yeah. Another question? Yes. Okay, so question is, how accurate is the King James Bible? Because we have a pretty accurate um, English version of the Bible that we use here, the 95. Mm -hmm. So where, where does the King James fall? Uh, it's, it's, it's got problems. And again, it's got problems because of the finite number of manuscripts they used. It's got problems because of the, the archaic usages of language. It also has problems in, in uh, some of the, like I say, with Hebrew, with other things. There were, I forget what, like 27 different Hebrew birds that they just called owls because they didn't know what else to do with it. Um, so yeah, you've got a lot of owls in the Bible that probably aren't all owls. Um, there, there's other things that are, that are issues with, with King James. I'm, I'm not, I don't hate it. I'm not condemning of it, but it's, it's not the New American Standard and it's not the, the Christian Standard. It's not the Holman. It's not some of the more modern ones that I think are based on better manuscripts and updated in terms of language. So I ask because when you look at the, the preface for the New American Standard, they list the King James as part of the heritage. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like for the Psalms, I think. Wasn't that the 77 was the Psalms like from the King James? They actually kept some of the, the these and the thous and some of the, they kept some of the King James-ish kind of language for poetic passages. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, uh, Ripplinger, bad guy, Ruckman, bad guy. Ruckman goes so far as to affirm that the Greek text must be corrected by the King James Version. Are you kidding me? We're going to fix the Greek text from the English translation? Noteworthy is a statement that mistakes in the AV 1611 are advanced revelation. So you can't call it a mistake. It's an advanced revelation that's fixing a, a different mistake. Anyway, it's, it's insane. So know that they're out there. Armed with this presupposition that the King James is an errant, re-inspired version, adherents of this view speak of other translations as perverted Bibles. A lot of times they mock it as, a, as an Alexandrian perversion because uh, they understand that there were some Alexandrian Greek manuscripts underlying the critical text of the Greek New Testament. And, and Alexandrian sounds scary. Okay? Perverted Bibles, Bible haters... Anyway, and, and the saddest thing is, I, I think they honestly don't know any better. I think they're just ignorant and they're zealous in their ignorance. And, and so you want to be patient and kind towards them, but sometimes patience runs out and uh, kindness gets thin. And, and even if you accept it, well, what are we doing with the Spanish world or the Russian world or the German world or what's the rest of the planet supposed to do? Are they stuck with those with the unfixed Greek manuscripts that, that uh, their translations didn't fix, like King James fixed it for the English? Anyway, it's ludicrous. Um, and yeah, why only a recent edition of the King James? Why not the original one? The original edition has innumerable errors. In Matthew 26, 36, the name of Judas was used instead of the name of Jesus. I think, I think that's a problem. Okay. In the second edition, 20 words are repeated in Exodus 14.10. Even the two editions that were both issued in 1611, they differed from each other. Later printings had problems, like the Wicked Bible, left out the word not, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Intentional changes were made in 1612 and 1613. In 1659, Kilburn claimed to find 20,000 errors that had crept into six different editions. And so thankfully, Scrivener... Um, yeah, we've got some later revisions that are kind of now standardized as of, I think, 1789, if I remember right. I mean, there's a whole history here on the King James Bible. This is a pretty good thumbnail, though. All right. Hmm. Yeah, let's talk about some of these and then we'll call it a day here. We don't want to diminish the human side of the Bible. In fact, I think it's a glory. 
to use 40 different authors and still come up with a single message that you have with the, the overall uh, message of the Word of God. Human authors, 40 of them, at least 40, because we don't know some of them. We don't know some of the Psalms, and we don't know. Um, we're still technically debating Hebrews, okay, which might be one more, but if it's Luke, well, then that's one less, because he's already one of our enumerated authors. Uh, written in human languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Different literary styles, poetry, prose, different literary forms, allegory, parables, symbols, metaphors, even satire, hyperbole. Different human perspectives. You get a shepherd's perspective, a prophet perspective, a pastor perspective, a historian, a chronicler. You have slaves writing the Bible. You have kings writing the Bible. You've got all these things. Speaking from an observer's perspective, like the sun rose, the sun set, using round numbers is not a problem. Human thoughts and processes, not a problem. Even a memory lapse. I like that. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 16. There's a memory lapse recorded in the scriptures. When Paul says, I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And then two verses later, he remembered, oh yeah, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. So there's a little bit of a memory lapse there that finds its way into the inspired canon. I love that. Revealing human emotion, sorrow, anger, melancholy, loneliness, so many more, joy. Human interests, the medical interests, the rural interests, the shepherd interests, all these things. Paul, you think, how many, Paul probably had season tickets for the Olympic Games. I mean, he was, he was talking about uh, boxers and wrestlers and runners and he was, uh, you know, Corinth was an Olympic city and he had exposure to these things. Semitic culture, other human sources, even pagan sources, quoting uh, pagan poets. So yes, we have to, uh, have to embrace that. Here's a problem. Failing to engage the intellectual culture. Okay, question here. Microphone back. You haven't had any questions yet today. I, I gotta give you I gotta make sure you get one in. All right. Uh, number ten, like uh in in the section above. Uh -huh. When he mentions uh Jude quoting from the book of Enoch, is that the the book of Enoch that talks about the Nephilim or is is this Yep. Okay. What is the time, like, is that actually, like, do we think that it was actually written by Enoch, or is that... Probably how, not, no, nobody nobody that? thinks that. Yeah. So yeah, so, I mean, Enoch couldn't have written in Greek, so, um, yeah, so the, the biblical Enoch in the fifth generation from Adam was not writing in Greek. Okay. So, yeah, no, the, it's an apocryphal book, it does not belong in the Bible, okay. but one of the stories, or a couple of the stories from that book are historically, factually true, and the Holy Spirit inspired them. In, uh, in Jude, so that's not, a, not an issue. Same thing with the assumption of Moses. Because when Jude, he, sa does, he says like, Enoch the fifth from Adam uh, and quotes this prophecy, is that prophecy something from the book of Enoch or is that a prophecy that was a revelation to Jude that Enoch had, but we didn't have that actual record? I think that's the case, yes. Okay, so this isn't the apocryphal book of Enoch that he's right. mentioned. Right. Okay. Yep. All right, then um, the extreme fundamentalist view of the Bible also tends to be anti-intellectual. I want us to be aware of this, okay? Because in some cases, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, the expert says this, it has to be wrong. Oh, the hoity-toity uh, professors say this. Okay, well, so slow down, okay? Uh, because uh, the, the errors of that side uh, does not mean you throw out anything with respect to scholarship, anything with respect to a true, legitimate uh, study of the Word of God. And so, um, and, and I think it's worth speaking of too, for example, as students, you guys here need to um, understand this, that if, anything, if any attack is leveled against you guys, as if somehow a, a local church seminary is something that's anti-intellectual or anti-hostile to graduate schools or universities or, or formal seminaries, things of that nature. Um, 
that may come up, all right, and just deal with it. Talk about it and, and just laugh at them. <laughs> Say, well, no, we're not anti-intellectual. We, in fact, we, we study to show ourselves approved and we are absolutely, uh, we're going to be as intellectual as the next guy, but we're going to be fair to the text is what we're going to be. And we're going to be fair to what the Bible says about itself. Nevertheless, yeah, there are some Bible thumpers out there that just laugh at all kinds of science and, and uh, view it as, they say, well, who needs physicists? I've got the Bible. Okay, well, uh, I think we still need physicists, <laughs> all right? Yeah. We need people doing physics. All right. It fails to study carefully and respond insightfully to the current culture. And they would have never dreamed of quoting Epimenides like Paul did, right? In quoting a pagan poet, po you know, they weren't engaged in culture. Now, we don't want to be poisoned by the culture, but we should at least be aware of it so we can uh, shepherd our people and deal with these things. All right, so here's this conclusion. The more moderate fundamentalists, which in large respects, the categorical doctrinal movement really is. It's, it's, it's kind of a step in between the, the, the Geisler evangelicals or the, uh, maybe you would call them the, the Billy Graham evangelicals and the J. Frank Norris uh, fundamentalists, okay? I would put Colonel Theme kind of in the, in the middle of that spectrum. Half evangelical, half fundamental. Anyway, um, so we can praise the... the the moderate types, and uh, we can take issue with the more extreme types. We're going to reject the King James only insanity. Biblical docetism. We're downplaying the human elements of Scripture and by stressing the divine side. You're wrong to go to either extreme. We talked about the neo-evangelicals that completely ignored the divine side of the Bible by only stressing the human side and how error comes in there. Same thing if you deny the humanity of the Bible and you're just completely with divine dictation. You've got to have both. All right. Yep. The God, God, the words of God and the words of the human authors that he moved upon. There it is. Second Peter 1.20. I was trying to remember. No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will in other words, nobody came along and said, I'm going to prophesy something today. No. Men moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit breathed in and through them. The Holy Spirit, oh, and then the human said, oh, I guess today's the day. I'm writing part of the Bible. Here we go. Okay. And to have that sense, to have that awareness, to understand that God is working through you to produce this, uh, this perfect thing. Moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. All right, any questions? Okay. Okay. Unrelated questions. Okay. Oh. All right. There's a term uh, that Geisler mentioned, but I can't remember, and I can't find it. It's, um, it's, not, it's not evolution like the, um, it's not like theological evolution, but we, we do gain knowledge as time progresses. You know, we, we mm -hmm. have a lot more knowledge now than, than 500 years ago about the Word of God. Right. So what is the term that Geisler uses? He might have used something like progressive revelation. He might have used something like, um, I don't know, if you find it, let me know. I'll take a look at it. Because, yeah, there's, there's different terms for that. We do stand on the shoulders of giants. We do advance beyond where the generations before us took theological understandings. There's no question about that. Um, there's a great book by James Orr that's called The Progress of Dogma, which uh, I, I enjoy. I think he's on target uh, because he pointed out that uh, throughout the history of the church, the great controversies, the great heresies, the great debates, you know, early on it was Trinity. It was the issue of Christ. It was the issue of hypostatic union. And those, those those fights came early and those, those things were dealt with in, in the early councils at Nicaea and other early church councils. But then later on you have other developments. By the time you get to the Reformation, we were having the battle about justification by grace through faith and locking down the issues there. And, and why did it take until the 19th century really for a full, complete, developed eschatology utilizing a literal hermeneutic brings us to the more mature uh, expressions of dispensationalism and things of that nature. Even though you can find early versions, the full, complete, systematized, mature versions 
they, because those battles didn't come so early. Okay? They came later. Once the earlier things were settled, the later things got fought about later. So, um, and who knows, we may have something coming up that we're going to fight about in our, in our day that we just, church hasn't gotten around to yet. But it's coming up, so buckle your seatbelt. I'm, I'm down for it. I'm not going to avoid the fight <laughs> if it comes right to it, you know. All right. Yes, sir. Last question. Okay. So um, going back to what you had said earlier, uh, well, not what you had said, but kind of something that C.S. Lewis sort of like believed in, and I, I'm, I've encountered people like this before. They believe in God and evolution. It's so strange. Theistic evolution. Theistic yeah. evolution. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that? How did Lewis come to that conclusion? I know he well, was surrounded by academics. Again, a lot of people tried to. They tried to combine. They wanted to have both and. They wanted to... They wanted to admit that the scientists were right about evolution, but then they wanted to admit that the Bible was right about creation. So they said, hey, let's just combine them. Okay? And uh, so, yeah, God in the beginning, but then things evolved after that, that he used evolution as a process. Okay? But that's not what the text describes. The text describes kinds that are created as kinds and then reproduce as kinds. And that, that whole approach to kinds, I think, destroys theistic evolution. Right. Right. All right, so next week is chapter 25, the historicity of the Old Testament. And we're going to be one chapter per week for the rest of the book. And we're also leaving, by the way, the segment of um, all of these recent chapters have been... Man, we covered a lot today. There's chapter 20. All right. Well, this may not be worth it, but goodness, here we go. Chapter 19. All right, so in part two of the Bible, we've got an introduction here, and we're going through section one, biblical, section two, historical, and then section three, um, theological. All right, so we're done with the biblical, we're done with the historical, now we're getting ready for the theological section of bibliology. And this will get us to some wonderful chapters on the history of the Old Testament, the historicity, I should say, of the Old Testament, the historicity of the New Testament, the inerrancy of the Bible, building on everything we've been covering so far, but giving you a whole chapter on inerrancy, canonicity of the Bible. We haven't really talked about this as much, but why do we, why do we reject one Enoch? Why do we accept Second Peter? Why do we, you know, some of the ones that were debated back in the day? So canonicity gets its own chapter, and then the summary in uh, chapter 29, the evidence for the Bible. Why do we believe the Bible is true? Why do we trust it? Why do we study it? Why do we spend our lives devoted to understanding what it says? So it's a good chapter to conclude the, uh, the entire volume. All right, that's where we'll be for the next five weeks. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for truth. Thank you for our missionary visit. Thank you for just everything. This day is a, a testimony to your abundant grace. And we give you the praise and the glory, Father. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Austin Bible Church is a grace ministry. No price is ever assigned to any video, audio, printed material, or anything provided by this ministry. Costs associated with such grace provision are paid in full by grace-oriented, born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Motivated by God the Holy Spirit, well-pleasing to God the Father. More information on our grace-giving policy and your opportunity to join in this Grace Financial Fellowship can be found at the link in the description below.